Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Joe Montori. I'm the executive director of Sustainable Putnam in Putnam County in the Mid-Hudson Valley region. Um, so we're going to start our presentation in just a couple minutes. I just want to remind people to keep your microphone muted throughout the presentation. Um, there'll be a Q&A afterwards for our speaker, Tom Conrad. And feel free to post uh, <clears throat> to post your questions in the chat uh, at any time, and uh, we'll uh, we'll pass these along to Tom after his presentation. As you probably are aware, we are re recording the presentation, and it will be posted to YouTube on the Third Thursday Environmental Series channel and on the Sustainable Putnam uh, channel. Um, so uh, I. Just want to do a quick introduction of Tom. I, I know Tom is a clean energy coach through the New Yorkers for Clean Power. Um, but, you know, after I asked him if he would do this presentation, I learned a, a little bit more about him. Uh, and he's way more accomplished than that. He and I are both energy coaches, but um, he this, this guy is a, a chartered financial analyst and he has a PhD in mathematics, which that kind of blew me away right, right from the start there. Um, he manages the Foundation Green Income Fund, which is a hedge fund focused on high dividend clean energy stocks. And he's also the editor of altenergystocks.com. And finally, he chairs the Environmental Conservation Commission for the town of Marbletown. So uh, without further ado, Tom. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, hopefully I'll live up to it. So. Um, this is what we're trying to do. Basically, I'm trying to help people. And that's what I did with altenergystocks.com. That resource is there just for basically to help small investors figure out how to invest in clean energy um, more than getting out of fossil fuels. I'm really more about doing positive things as opposed to not doing negative things, although I like both. Um, and uh, these are the three groups that Joe mentioned that are sponsoring this particular talk. This is, I'm not an investment advisor. So just to be distinct, an um, investment advisor takes what you, understands what a person needs for their investments. I'm not that. I know what my hedge fund needs, but um, without going through someone's background, an advisor really has to, not every investment is right for everybody. So this is an educational pr presentation. Um, and nothing I say is meant to be the right advice for you although I'll do the best I can in terms of helping you along the way and figuring out what is right for you. So you may be here for a lot of reasons. A lot of people are um, you know, worried about climate change as I am. And if you have significant investments, probably what you do with those investments is actually more important for the planet than what you do with your personal life. Um, you know, whether it's become a vegetarian or vegan or get an electric car or put solar panels on your house. You know, uh, the average carbon footprint of a person in our economy is maybe 10, 14 uh, uh, tons of CO2 a year. You know, if you have a large investment portfolio, the impact of that portfolio can be far, a far greater scale than um just whatever you happen to be doing in your life. Um, it also makes sense that to get out of fossil fuels if you really think that they are going to have political problems. You know, um, it's it's a risk. The fossil fuel companies have risk because um, we're going to have to stop using them, and that won't be good for their business. Uh, so. One of the first questions a lot of people ask about getting out of fossil fuels is, and actually assume that we will, that it'll, it actually costs you something to get out. Um, so this is a five-year chart of several different major indices. Um, the two blue lines are the S&P 500, a broad market index. And then the lighter blue line above it is the S&P 500 without any fossil fuel companies in it. And as you see, the if you took the fossil fuel companies out of the S&P 500, you pretty much got the same performance, but maybe it was a little better over the last five years. Um, so 
certainly for the last five years, you haven't lost anything. And if you look what happens to sort of these pure fossil fuels, the uh, pink and the um, purple, the oil and gas producers and the natural gas companies, they've actually done poorly compared to the market in general. So there really was no problem being out of them. I did a version of this presentation three years ago in 2020 and did the same chart back then. Um, one thing that's interesting about that chart is there was also this line for the coal ETF. And when the companies in an ETF are in a real bad, have a real bad time, and a lot of them start going bust, they get rid of the ETF. And I couldn't do the coal ETF this time because it's totally gone. So basically, um, you know, between these two charts, we have an eight-year span. And um, again, during that previous five years, we'd had a slightly better performance if you'd ignored fossil fuels. And the actual fossil fuel companies had been doing even worse. Um, so historically, you just don't have to give up anything to get out of fossil fuels. The, the risks to being in a declining industry um, have not been worth it. Um, and yes, often fossil fuels look cheap, um, but I like to say everything looks cheap before it is worthless. And uh, this is a picture of a, um, a ghost town in Colorado that I took. Um, after the silver boom in the early 1900s. Silver's still with us, but those silver companies aren't. Um, so even if you believe that fossil fuels will be here for a long time um, in some form or another, that doesn't mean that they're a good investment. A lot of people confuse that. Um, just because something's gonna be here for a long time does not make it a good investment. Those are different things. So, once, now that we've talked about why you shouldn't, there's the how, and there's several approaches. Um, for most people, if you don't want to make this investing a large part of your life, you might want to use an investment advisor. And um, the bad news is that most investment advisors are behind the curve on getting out of fossil fuels. It's really the, most of them basically only do it if their clients ask them. And because of that, they aren't very good at it. They just sort of, you know, they do as much as they have to to keep the client happy. Um, but there are some that are green. And if you want to choose one, if, if you're thinking about it, um, these are the pros and cons. Um, the biggest con is, of course, you have to pay for someone's time. And especially if you don't have a big portfolio, you can't afford to pay very much if you want to keep decent returns. Um, there are some advisors who won't charge you. Instead, they'll charge you a commission for putting you in a mutual fund or something. Um, but you're paying either way. Um, and you're, the ones that do it with commission tend to send you towards mutual funds. They'll charge a big commission because they do need to be paid. Um, if they don't, work on commission, a lot of them do um, a charge on a percentage of your portfolio, which is sort of the fairer way to do it or the way that aligns them more with your interest. A lot of those just won't take small clients uh, because you know if I'm charging you 1% of your portfolio and your portfolio is only $10,000, well, that's $100 a year and that's not gonna be worth the 20 hours I'm gonna have to spend on you. Um, the pros are basically, Someone else will do it for you. It's complex. Most people want don't want to deal with it. Um, and it's good if you don't know how to start. Um, I generally don't think, I mean, even if you're there, I think that you should probably go with good enough um, until you have a big enough portfolio to make it worth a good investment advisor's time. But um, when you when your portfolio is say fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars, um well, then you can probably afford an advisor without damaging returns too much. Um, and if you're going to choose an advisor, I would, and you care about this stuff, I strongly recommend you choose an advisor who makes this part of their core business, because that one will understand the um, what they're doing better. And um, also we're sort of, you know, it's basically... Pay your money to support people who are advancing the industry 
as opposed to people who are dragging their feet. Um, it's the same as what you invest in. If you believe that you should invest in green stocks, well, maybe you the part of your investment portfolio that's going to the advisor should also go to a green advisor. Um, you want, as I said earlier, you want to do fee only as opposed to a commission-based advisor. Um, everyone will tell you that except for the commission-based advisors. <laughs> um, but even though it hurts to write a check out front um, or take that percentage, um, but it's much better than getting advice that's basically influenced by who's, you want to actually be the client. You don't want the mutual fund to be the client or the advisor. And the person who pays is the client, not you. Um, most advisors use mutual funds. Um, a few advisors use individual stocks. Um, and uh, the mutual funds, as you'll see, some of them are not that great for this. But, um, and I, I, if you're going to play for pay, an, uh, an investment advisor, I generally would lean towards one that uses individual stocks because then you're just paying him. You're not paying him to choose a mutual fund, which then charges its own fee or her. And actually, fortunately, uh, among the green advisors I know, um, a lot of them are her. I would say 50-50. Um, the, among the investment advisors I know, they're mostly him <laughs> um, in general. So the different designations um, that you should pay attention to when you're looking for an advisor, you don't, a lot of advisors don't have a designation and I think you can be good without one. Um, but the two that are, I consider meaningful are the CFP and that's the certified um, financial planner. And they have basically a master's level degree in understanding how to help people develop financial plans, as in how to figure out how much money you will need at some point, how much you need to save, um, and how to do that. Um, the certification I have is less common, the Chartered Financial Analyst, and um, that is really about stock picking, picking investments, um, which is very useful if you have an advisor. Um, but it does not cover um, as well the parts about building a financial plan. And really, actually, one of the biggest values that an uh, advisor can be for you is actually the part that's not picking stocks, as in helping you actually save. Um, if, and, there's, and that level of hand-holding. I, I think that there's a lot of things that people can do um, there that are, that are worth a lot of, a lot of, that have a lot of value even if they're hard to pay for. Um, there's a couple other, RIA basically means that you're registered and you're, it's legal for you to advise somebody. So anyone who's an advisor should be have RIA or IAR, investment advisor representative somewhere on their card. That just means it's legal for them to give advice. Um, and they're, they're regulated by either the state or the uh, SEC, depending on how big they are. So that that's, those are the type of advisors you might want to choose, um, but then you have to. You also have to know what you're trying to do. And there's sort of two main camps of green investing. Um, we're hearing a lot now about ESG investing, which um, the Republicans these days call woke investing, which is basically considering environmental factors, um, social benefits, and governance factors, governance meaning how well is the company run in their investment decisions. Um, since there are risks to companies based on how their environmental, um, their environmental profile and how well they treat their customers and employees, and how well they're governed, those are all risks to the company and therefore risks to the stock. To me, that's just good investing. You're paying attention to a category of risks. Um, there's lots of other risks you need to pay attention to too, um, but that's what ESG investing is. And when you see sort of social funds, ESG funds, there's level there's 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 a big question about how much attention they're paying to those risks and that why that's the main criticism of a lot of these ESG funds they're better than not paying attention to that but how much attention they are um 
the type I do in my fund is called generally called impact investing, which is investing in companies that are actively trying to fix the problems. Um, I personally only do impact investing on the environmental side. There, you could obviously do impact investing for any sort of social change or any change in the world economy you wanted to. Um, but it's sort of a, the ESG is avoid risk that might come from these factors. Impact investing is let's try to solve the problem. Um, most of what you'll find out there is ESG investing, and it's a lot better than not doing anything. Um, finding impact mutual funds is very hard. Um, so if you're investing, your, your advisor who uses a mutual fund might put you in an ESG mutual fund um, that look for companies that are have better behavior on these factors. Different funds will weight different factors differently. And um, sometimes it's really hard. I mean, there's a lot of rating systems with ESG factors that just can't decide. Um, for instance, Tesla scores great on environmental factors. Elon Musk has done incredible things for starting the whole move to electric cars. Um, however, governance is horrible because the company is run by one guy um, and he has complete control. So basically he can do whatever he wants with the money. And social is generally considered pretty bad because he doesn't treat his employees well. Um, and if you look at what he's doing with Twitter, again, uh, there's lots of questions. So an ESG score isn't just one. You'll find some ESG funds that love Tesla. You'll find some that wouldn't include it just because of they are putting different weights on different factors. Um, but again, it's better that they're trying than not trying at all. Um, Unfortunately, ESG mutual funds tend to have slightly higher fees than your typical fund. Um, it may be a bit of a, you get what you pay for. You're, they're doing more work, hopefully. Um, some of them also are careful to use the stocks they own to vote in company elections to try to improve those companies. Um, and if you're in like a 401k plan with your money, Often all you can do is choose between mutual funds. And um, in that case, you're often lucky if you have an ESG mutual fund to choose from at all. Um, and um, if you want to make your portfolio better um, than it currently is, just swapping an ESG fund for what you currently have that has similar risk profile is probably um, is a, probably a real improvement. Um, there are a few impact mutual funds out there. Um, they often focus on an industry, like say, if you want an environmental um, impact fund, you just find one that puts all its money into the renewable energy industry um, or electric cars or water, or say, if you are worried about um, gender equality, uh, women-led firms. Um, as an aside, there's been a lot of research search that women-led firms actually perform better than men-led firms. Um, in general, in our economy, um, it may be that because women are smarter, it may just be because if you are a smart enough woman to get to the head of a firm in our economy, well, then you really are smarter than most of the men leading firms. Um, but they are they they have been performing better. So, I mean, you know, and if you want to support those women, you may be doing well. Um the problem with impact funds is because you, you may lose diversification, which can add some risk to your portfolio. Um, you, you're not investing in the old economy if you're focusing on a few industries. Um, and so for many people, you might want to put some of impact funds in your economy and then try to balance them with other types of investments. Um, a few alternative energy, renewable energy funds I'm familiar with. Um, are listed on the right. New alternatives I like. They have a lot of the same holdings that I do. Um, but Ecofin Global Renewables in Infrastructure Fund, these are a few that um, uh, I can't really comment on how good they are because I am not a mutual fund expert, but they, they are out there. Um, generally, probably not a great place for your entire portfolio, but certainly 
some place where you can put um, money in. Um, good way to find them, you just search for relevant keywords in lists of mutual funds and then do a little further research. Um, on the cons, as I said, they often have some risk that you wouldn't have in the whole market, some specific risks. Um, and you sort of need to select, well, what exactly theme you want. Um, you're not going to find them in your 401k plans. Um, and then there's just also a lot of risk that once you, as a, as a novice, as a non-professional investor, if you start getting really specific about how you choose your investments, um, that's how people tend to make bad decisions, bad investing decisions, sort of chasing, oh gosh, I've heard Bitcoin is great. It's going to democratize the um, economy and um, look how that has gotten everybody. I mean, now everybody probably wants to invest in AI. Same thing could happen. Um, and even if a, um, a theme takes over and actually does pervade the economy and does change the whole economy, say, as the internet did, if you'd been investing in the internet during the internet bubble in 1999-2000, you would have had to wait it until 2020 to get your money back after the crash, even though Amazon, you know, basically, and Facebook basically rule the world these days, you know, along with Google. Um, so just because a sector will be the, you know, dominant in 20 years does not make it the best investment. And it's, the more you dig into a specific sector that way, the easier it is often to fool yourself um, that familiarity and your knowledge of the long-term trend will make that a great investment. Um, that same problem is true with stock portfolios. In fact, it can be even worse. So once you get down to the level of individual stocks, a lot of, um, you can really get caught up in the stories of those particular companies and miss why they may not um, do well. Um, and also with stock portfolios, I mean, it's, again, since you want to as, develop, if you want to develop a, a, a diversified portfolio, you have to look at a lot of stocks to put there. Um, it's dangerous because you can get caught up. Um, you can follow the flavor of the moment, buy high, sell low. The reason a stock is selling for a lot is because lots of people are interested in it. And as those cycles come and go, well, most people bought when most people were buying, most people sold when most people are selling, that's called buy low, sell high. So if you are like other people about when you buy things, you are almost guaranteed to be buying low and buying high and selling low. Um, if you're a contrarian and you manage to buy things when everyone is disinterested, that's how you buy low and sell high. It's very hard to do emotionally. Um, it is low cost, except for the money you lose if you don't do it well. You don't have to pay very much at all. Um, so with all these cautionary tales, um, there are a few things you can do. Um, you know, I do think you don't want to just look at your stock market investments. Banking is good. Um, and um, I bank with uh, Clean Energy Credit Union. I keep my um, checking and savings accounts there. Um, they are, a credit union is basically a mutually held bank. Um, they're much smaller. They only invest in their members. Um, and Clean Energy Credit Union makes loans to people putting solar on their houses, improving energy efficiency, buying electric cars. Um, so I know that my money that's in the bank account or a CD is actually helping someone do that. So that's sort of a, um, what I would call a safe impact investment. Um, I can't call us any stock market investment safe, but um, a credit union deposit is insured by um, the NCUA, the credit union's body that's the same, that's similar to the FDIC, up to, again, a quarter million dollars, 250,000. If you have $250,000 or less um, in there, there's a body, a government body that guarantees your investment. Um, the first investment I made when I was 20 years old, or let's see, I guess I was 22 as a, uh, I got my, I was getting a, starting to get a regular paycheck as a grad student, um, teaching mathematics. And I 
opened a two thousand dollar certificate of deposit at my local credit union, um, and that started my um, IRA. Um, it was nice because I didn't have to think about it much. Um, I think that's a good approach for people getting started investing. Why spend all this time figuring out what a best stock is, what mutual fund, trying to find an advisor who's not going to charge you more than your tiny portfolio can bear, when really what you need to be doing is socking as much money as you can away until it's big enough to be worth spending all the time or paying for advice on. Um, so I actually had a couple people who work at nonprofits ask me recently how to start um, retirement plans. And really my advice now is take that $6,000 you can put in a retirement a, um, IRA every year, put it in um, uh, a um, certificate of deposit with something with a credit union, hopefully clean energy credit union. But even if you use like a local credit union, like um, uh, Hudson Valley Credit Union, you know that they're only making loans to their members. They're not investing in fossil fuels. Um, with clean energy credit union, if you're willing to work with an online credit union, um, you know that it's going to stuff that really is helping to solve the problem. And it's insured. It'll earn 4 or 5%. And you do that for a few years. Put that 6000 or whatever you can away every year. And five, 10 years later, you'll actually have enough to take out and put into a um, something that is managed professionally. Or you'll have enough money there to make it worth your time to manage it well. Um, Another thing that you can do that's actually a relatively safe investment, and I think everyone who's considering stock market investments or already has them should think about, is the same stuff that Joe and I do coaching on. Make investments in your home. Make investments in your life. Pay down debt. Um, if you have a good roof, um, a solar solar on your roof is like buying a CD that pays somewhere between five and 15%, depending on how good your roof is. Um, you're not going to get that from even clean energy credit union. <laughs> um, so if you actually have some money to invest, um, solar panel, sign up for a coaching session with either through Sustainable Putnam, if you're in Putnam County, or uh, through Clean Energy, uh, New York's for Clean Power, and we'll find some stuff, ways to invest in your life first. Um, downside is most people, even if they own a home, probably can't put more than fifty, hundred thousand dollars in it. But those will tend to be very good investments compared to the stock market, mainly because the risks are low, um, and they're also impact investments in the sense that they tend to be really cutting carbon. Carbon. Um, not everything you can do is a good financial investment in your home. Um, but a lot of them are, and there are things you can do that are way better. Um, and if you want to know which which one's which, get a coaching session. You can't figure it out yourself. Um, paying down debt's important too. Um, again, oh, this is any advisor should tell you this before you invest in the stock market. The only risk paying down debt is like buying a CD that has an interest rate equal to the interest rate on your debt, except that it will never go away. It's the only way you could lose that money is if you went bankrupt and you're a lot less likely to go bankrupt on if you have less debt that you paid down. Um, a plug-in car, uh, EV, probably costs a little bit more than a gas car. But if you're buying a car, that extra investment will easily pay for itself on the uh, fuel savings and the maintenance savings. So there, there's tons of things like that that are good investments. Um, after you've run out of those investments, that's when you should start looking at decarbonizing your portfolio. Um, unless that money is in a retirement account, then there's tax consequences of taking it out. Um, so selecting mutual funds. Um, before you select the mutual funds, you need to sort of look at what type of funds you want. Do you want income funds, bond funds? Do you want equity funds? Um, an advisor will help you. There's like a rule of thumb that generally um, your portfolio should get less risky 
as you get older, you should allocate more towards um, safer bonds or income investments and less towards the stock market, which can go up and down. When you're young, they can go up and down more. Simple rule of thumb is you should subtract your age from 110, and that's the percentage of your, of your portfolio that should go in stocks. The rest should go in bonds. Um, and you could substitute things like CDs at a credit union for the bonds. They're essentially the same thing, income investments. Um, so you know, you know how to choose bond funds. You can also go to um, most online brokerages have a robo-advisor, they'll pick out, you just put in some data about how old you are, how risky you wanna be, what's your income, what are your savings goals, and they'll give you a portfolio of different types of funds. They'll probably do it with their mutual funds, but you know if they say they wanna put you in the Vanguard um, aggregate stock market fund, well, then you just look at a whole, you could just replace that with a whole stock market fund that has an ESG twist or hopefully even more of a impact twist, um, or at least is fossil fuel free. Um, you can do the same with the, uh, if they put you in a bond market fund, although I would just substitute that whole bond market fund and buy a CD at Clean Energy Credit Union. <laughs> um, it's, an inc it's, a, it's a safe income investment that'll balance your portfolio and keep your risk down. Um, you know, the other thing to think about funds are whether they're active or passive. Uh, a passive fund is often called an index fund. It's a fund that's not trying to beat the market. It's trying to just be average. And the nice thing about that is when you're trying to be average, it's actually something you can do without making mistakes. And you usually pay less for that. Um, studies of mutual funds on average show that you don't get anything extra on average. If you just randomly select an active mutual fund that tries to beat the market, it won't after you start paying the fees for trying to beat the market. Um, so that's the reason, if, um, the idea between, behind index funds. If you just pay less, you'll do better. Um, there are some funds that do beat the market consistently. And, um, one thing that's been shown to predict that frequently, it's not 100%, but if you pick funds that um, are highly concentrated, just hold relatively few stocks and make big bets on those stocks, that means the manager is willing to take risks and they actually believe in what they're doing. Um, those managers tend to get fired if they don't actually know what they're doing. So it's sort of a it's it's a really high risk strategy for a mutual fund manager to really have a concentrated portfolio with a low number of holdings, and that means that that manager's actually probably been doing pretty well doing it. Um, mutual funds with lots of different holdings tend to be very perform close to the market, but then lag because they have a bigger fee. Um, and if you're not willing to sort of not have market performance. Um, you could always do an index fund for a lot of your portfolio. And then, so you can, you can keep your portfolio close to the whole market by doing an index fund with most of it. And then if you're going to buy a, an active fund at all, I really say you should buy an active fund that only has a few holdings. You have one manager who really believes in what he's doing or she's doing and has had a good track record doing that. But you don't put your whole, you don't have to put your whole money in that. So if you, if most of your um, investment is in, a, in an index fund, and a little bit is in this really concentrated, um, high conviction fund, well, then your portfolio looks kind of like your average mutual fund in that it's close to the market, but you're only paying extra on that little slice that's different. So you pay for the person who's really convicted, but you don't pay as much because you're not paying on the rest of your fund that just looks like the market. You can get looking like the, looking like the market for almost free. If you want to pay for skill, just do it in the part where you're really getting skill. No guarantees skill will perform better, but if you want to have a chance, why, why pay extra for it? Um, so once you know what your portfolio should look like, the mix of stocks 
and bond funds, et cetera. Um, or you have a 401k that has a list of funds you can choose from, and they have like one ESG fund. Um, a really good tool for choosing between them is um, fossilfreefunds.org. It's not perfect, but you can put in there. Uh, you can go there. You can put the mutual funds in there. Um, you can select their top scoring funds just if you want to have some ideas. Um, and there's different things they score funds on. Deforestation, environmental, uh, women leaders, staying away from guns and tobacco. You can sort of pick what you want. Um, it's not as good at telling the difference between impact funds, but if you're looking for an ESG fund, it sort of is designed to run those filters well. Um, with the impact funds, often they they fail some of those filters, like the um, the renewable energy funds that I focus on and I'm most familiar with. They often are invested in companies that have giant investments in renewable energy and like maybe 5% of the portfolio is some natural gas plant that they used to own while they're, most of their electricity is generated from sun and wind. And they get um, bad scores on like the fossil fuel free scheme because they have some fossil fuels. Um, so if you're looking for impact funds, it's not a great tool, um, but it is a good tool for choosing between ESG funds. Um, if you want to find impact funds, you really sort of need to focus on the keywords um, and look for those keywords that you're really concerned about in the mutual funds. And then you you read the fund strategy, see what they're trying to do. And if that works for you, that's what you want to do. Um, again, I think you should look at funds that don't have a ton of holdings. Um, you can look at the, you can find their holdings. If you look at the top 10 holdings, look at the percentages that are allocated to those. And you want to hit ones that, you know, more than half the fund is in those top 10 foldings. Because um, if you're going to pay for somebody to do the stock selection work for you, um, you don't want to pay for them to just buy the S&P 500 with most of their money and then play around with a little bit of it. You can buy the S&P 500 or the S&P 500 without fossil fuels with most of your money for not paying much. Then you put, then you focus just a little bit of your uh, money on an impact fund that's really do it, making a difference. Um, so as I was sort of saying, Wei, um, if, you're, if you are going to go out and do your own stock picking, um, it just get, it gets harder. Stock picking, the way to beat the market in stock picking is to be the smartest person looking at the stocks you're looking at. Um, if you're just a casual investor, you almost can't do that. <laughs> um, I mean, the way I try to do it in my hedge fund is I focus on stocks that are too small for bigger money managers to waste their time on. And that's because while I'm a smart guy, I know there are tons of other smart guys out there. They have lots of resources that I don't have looking at the same stocks. I can't be the smartest person there. But if I look at a stock that's too small for them, and too small means if you have $10 million to invest and you want to put a real percentage of your portfolio in it, well, you got to put half a million dollars into that stock. If the stock itself, you know, only is only a few, is only a hundred million, you'll actually be moving the stock too much to actually make a profit. To to actually take advantage of your own advice. Um, if, if you're a smaller investor, you can look at smaller stocks. Smaller stocks can be riskier, but I would just say stock picking is riskier. Um, there are safer, smaller stocks. It's um, And there are risky, large stocks. Um, I mean, you can think of tons of stories of the giant company going belly up. Um, and even more stories of tiny companies going belly up, but that's mostly because there are more tiny companies. Um, but my main thing about stock picking is you probably shouldn't do it. <laughs> if, if this is what you, if this is where you're learning about investing, uh, most people shouldn't do it. Um, you can find some lists of stocks um, on my website if you want specific stocks, 
But if you're going to do it again, put most of your portfolio somewhere safe and just play around with a few stocks. Um, and I have been, had been publishing a list of my top 10 clean energy stocks for the last decade, um, just for people like that who just wanted 10 stocks that they could throw in. Um, and it did pretty well, but I've, since the hedge fund started, it's been very hard for me to do that. There's a lot of rules about what I can write about if I'm actually trading in the stock for clients. So um, I can't guarantee I'm going to keep that up. I still have lists that I maintain of stocks in particular industries that you can look at. Um, you know, you want an electric vehicle stock, you can find it at Alta Energy Stocks. Um, but sort of the more curated lists, um, I, I have not been keeping up as well recently. Um, some of the rules I use when picking stocks is are um, I like things that have regular dividends um, that are already making money. You can make just as much money buying an out of favor company that makes that is um, has regular cash flow as you can buying a startup that will become the next big thing, but you're less likely to lose all your money because. 90% of the next Googles or really 99% of the companies that have been called the next Google are not with us. Um, it, it's very hard to identify those companies. Um, I try to identify profitable companies that just people aren't currently interested in. Um, you know, sort of what I talk about is a stock that I would really like is one that's making a lot of money selling low flush toilets. No one wants to talk about it. No one's excited to invest in it, but it's making money and I'll be able to buy it cheaply. Um, other tricks, there's a measure called beta, which talks about how risky a company is, how much it moves around in the market. Focusing on low to beta stocks is sort of another good rule of thumb. There have been studies that show those stocks tend to be less exciting, but they actually tend to deliver better performance in the long term. Um, and that's sort of the, 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 my overview. Um, I really like giving a lot of time to Q and A, so let's try to do that. And then actually I went on longer than I thought. Um, so hopefully I'll get, be able to get to everyone's questions and, uh, something does have, uh, those of you who are curating the chat, you want to run one up to me? Sure. Um, so, uh, Penny Penny asked, and I'm not sure if she was uh, joking or not, but she said, "What isn't a small client, or maybe what is a small client?" Is is the oh question. for for an investment advisor? I mean, it depends. He answered on the advisor. that. He did answer that. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you have less than, I mean, there a lot of advisors won't take anyone for if they have less than fifty, or some won't take anyone with less than a hundred thousand. Um, and uh, yeah, and I really think certainly if you have less than twenty five thousand, um, the the reason to get an a investment advisor really you want it, you might want to talk to a um, financial planner if you really feel out of your depth when it comes to money. But talking to advisor on choosing the best investment is hard to get what you pay for out of it because you just can't afford to pay very much. Um, which is why I kind of like just, oh, just buy a CD at a impact, um, at an impact uh, cl uh, credit union. I see Michael's got his hand up. Uh, but uh, okay, I'll, I'll let you run the chat. Run okay, the there's one, there's one earlier question, and then we'll get to Michael. Um, the other question was, what is an ETF? Okay, so um, an ETF is like a mutual fund. So a mutual fund is a bunch of, investments in a big bundle that you could buy a share on the mutual fund directly from the mutual com fund company. Uh, an ETF is also a bundle of an investments, um, but instead of buying it from the mutual fund company, you actually buy it from another investor on the stock market. So it trades like a stock. Um, ETFs are usually set up like index funds. That is, they're passive, but there are some active ones out there. Um, there's really no 
significant in, for the small investor advantage choosing between a mutual fund or an ETF. Um, it either one does pretty much the same thing. Um, so uh, it's it's really whether they match what your goals are. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael, you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, Tom, thank you. It was a very good presentation. Um, well, very well together. Uh, my question is, uh, is there such, do you know of a ETF that mirrors the S&P, so it would be a passive yeah. ETF, but has no uh, fossil fuel companies in it? Yeah, that was the one I used in my early example on the first page. Okay. Um, it's it's an ETF um, and it's SPY. So the, the S&P 500 is SPY. Right. Um, it's an ETF. Spy X Spy is the X. Okay. fossil fuels. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next is uh, Thad Kurtz, and then I see Alan's hand is up. Uh, Thad asks, is there anyone you respect who is still doing what you used to do with the 10 energy stocks posts? Um, not that I know of. Um, the, the problem is the same problem I'm running into if you're a professional money manager. It's very hard to legally talk about what you're doing. Um, before I started the mutual fund, I was managing money just for a family office. Basically, it was totally private money for a rich family. And they didn't mind. But now that I am doing it for a broader level of clients, um, I'm subject to more regulation. And basically, I can't say anything about a stock I'm going to about to buy <laughs> anytime soon. And um, as money goes in and out of the fund, I actually have to trade fairly often. So it makes it really hard to say anything. Occasionally there's a couple of weeks towards the end of the month when I don't, I, I have a window, but then I also have time to have to have time to write. Um, so no, I don't know anyone who's doing that top 10 list type thing. Um, Okay. Uh, I, I think there probably are some. There may be um, newsletter writers that do that, um, but I don't know of any. Okay, thanks. And Alan? Um, yeah, hi, Tom. Um, in addition to funds that play around in the stock market, there are some funds that also mix in bonds. Yeah. Um, are there any of those that are also... Um, that would be on your list? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say what I said about the stock funds, the same the same tools you can use, like the fossilfreefunds.org, you can run through, you can run bond funds through that too. Um, I'm not a bond specialist, so I don't know. And um, the difference, bond investing is more complex. You, you just, um, unless you're really rich, individual bonds are not a possibility because there's just too many bonds out there they're hard to, hard to trade but bond funds um yes there are some that are green um the last time i looked at them interest rates were so low it just wasn't worth the trouble <laughs> um but i think now the interest rates may be a little high you can look at the yield on them um and you can use the same tools uh the, the fossil free funds or org is good for that but really um I, I do think just buying a CD at a credit union will give you very similar performance um, to a bond fund. I mean, the, the, the point of a bond fund is that you have reliable income with very low risk to balance out a stock portfolio. And um, unless you have more than $250,000 to put in um, your bond fund, you're, you're fine just putting CDs in. Um, a bank account or a clean energy credit union, a clean energy account. Um, the the yields are are as good, or or similar, and um, the risk is lower because you actually have insurance. Okay. Um, if you have more than two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars to put in your income part of your portfolio, you can afford an advisor. <laughs> Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, but I uh, and and it. But if anybody does have another question, feel free to unmute and ask. Oh, Penny. 
Yes. Um, I'm unmuted. Um, I was wondering if there were any podcasts that you listened to to give you ideas about technologies or companies that are exciting. Um, I do. I listen to a lot of clean energy focused podcasts. Like um, so, but I, um, I listen to David Roberts, um, Volts. Yeah. Um, I like the Canary Media podcasts. Um, anything or from Canary Media. Um, uh, Stephen Lacey is, uh, is a leader in the clean energy podcasting. And I've been, uh, uh, listening to him for a long time. I've been on his podcast twice, so <laughs> I always listen to his stuff. Um, but, uh, so those are what I listen to. Um, I want to get caveat this, that exciting companies are not what you want to be investing in. I want to reemphasize that point. Um, so I listen to those types of podcasts to, for general industry trends. Um, if they're interviewing a specific company, it's almost certainly a company that I won't touch with a 10 foot pole. Um, most of the, although, and the small investor probably can't, most of the ones that like come on those podcasts are actually still private companies. They've never gone public. Um, okay. Thanks. Todd, did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. My question is, uh, well, I'm uh, I'm 75, so I'm not able to invest for the long term. Could you? What do you? What What do you think? I've always been very suspicious of annuities. Um, okay, I I did. I would so annuities are good for people who don't have enough money to live if they live too long. In other words, so if you if you if you have enough money that you could be comfortable at your current expenditure, um, living twenty years longer than you think you will, you absolutely do not want an annuity. Um, if you are worried about that, like you have just enough money to make it to your life expectancy at the lifestyle you level you want then you might consider an annuity to cover that risk that you live longer than you expect. Um, that's what they're for. It's, it's, it's insurance against living too long. And if you don't need that insurance, you don't want to buy th something you don't need is basically what I'm saying. Um, it, it's, it's, annuities are basically a financial thing, a package over a mutual fund, plus you're buying insurance on long, longevity risk. Um, and... Um, if you don't need that insurance, don't buy it. Is basically. Um, uh, but but if you if what about the doesn't your principal disappear when you die? Yes, but in other words, it does, you can't. It doesn't. You can't give it to your your daughter and son in laws. Right. Well, but if you don't have. Um, but again, if your risk is living too long, the risk to your daughter would be that she supports you when you live too long. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> um, so, so that's what it would be for. If you don't have the risk of living too long, if you can afford it, then the risk to your daughter is yes, that you'll live too long and you'll use up more of your money before you die. But you know, okay, I, I guess you're living willing to take that risk. I would say to anyone that don't buy an annuity and life insurance, right? Because right. they're insuring against the opposite risks. <laughs> you'll be better off if you buy neither. Um, life insurance is insurance that you die too soon to support somebody and give them that money. Um, an annuity is insurance that you'll live too long and won't have enough money for yourself. So choose one of those risks and insure against it. Never insure against both. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, do you feel like you, you might want to... Um, diversify your portfolio? And if you do, um, what do you think would be a safe place to to to, to go? Um, well, it depends on who you are. I mean, um, yeah, so, so to diversifying your portfolio means different things for different people, but it basically means you wanna own a lot of different investments that behave differently 
in different economic environments. So you don't want to have everything you own in electric car companies, because if electric cars don't do well and maybe hydrogen takes over, you're out of luck. Um, does that, uh, so I don't really, I'm not sure, maybe I just don't answer your question. If you're asking me personally, no, I feel like I'm sufficiently diversified. <laughs> um, um, and I, I do believe that there are green investments that can still be diverse. And that is because the entire economy needs to be greened. And so there are green companies in every part of the economy. All right. I guess I just feel like um, I, I I need to diversify um, you know, for the reason that you just stated. Um, so, well, I mean, I guess you'd have to tell me what you currently own. And I could potentially suggest a green investment that diversifies from your the current level of risks you have. Right. Um, wow. But I, I think where I was going with this was um, I'm, I'm having to sacrifice some of my standards uh, to, um, to, to be able to fully diversify. Um, um, right. So, I mean, do, so if, if the answer is, do I think I need to know? So a, an exaggerated thing would be, okay, if I don't own fossil fuels, I'm less diversified than if I owned everything but fossil fuels and fossil fuels. I don't think that anyone needs that much diversification. Yeah, I'm not doing fossil fuels, but- I, I know, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying, it, it, I don't think you need that much diversification. Um, I, I think, but it is harder. Um, so the way, one of the things I do is, if you are in less risky investments that are just fundamentally less risky, you need less diversification because diversification is a strategy of lowering risk. Right. Um, and so most of my investments, so like in, the, in my fund, are what would be called clean energy infrastructure investments. I own a lot of companies that just own solar and wind farms. Those are fairly low risk companies because the risk is for a company that owns solar panels is that the sun doesn't shine or the price of electricity falls. Those are fairly low risks. They're they not bankrupt. Yeah, but it's very hard for them to go bankrupt because their 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 cash flows are very are very steady. Um, so if the economy dives. The price of electricity often doesn't. The sun certainly keeps on coming up. Um, however, if you own, say, a car manufacturer, you are dependent that they don't they don't have they have supply chain risks that they might not be able to get the parts they need to make their cars. They have economic risks that the economy tanks and no one's buying cars anymore. There's a there's a, there's a whole different class of risks there. Um, and so. Yes, say 50% of my portfolio is in these stocks that are very concentrated and are in a specific industry, but it's a very low risk industry. Um, I would never put 50% of my um, portfolio in internet stocks. Those that, that has a lot of potential for growth or like AI, but it's also a lot of potential for risk. So you have to sort of differentiate. So another way to lower, there are different ways to lower risk. Try to be in different sectors. And, you know, I diversify like those infrastructure companies by investing in different technologies, investing in clean energy infrastructure in different parts of the world um, and so forth. So there, there's, there's ways to be diverse um, beyond just number of stocks and numbers of industries. Um, there's a, there's one more question, Tom, from um, from Bob Barrett. Hi, <clears throat> um, I have a kind of specific question. I have um, most of the portfolio I have is managed by TIAA. Yeah. But I have my own account at Charles Schwab, yeah. and I thought it might be, and many of the stocks in that were suggested by you, Tom, mm -hmm. um, when I pretty regularly uh, went to altenergy.com. But anyway, the question I have is, um, 
I recently added, thinking that it added to that portfolio stock in uh, engine number one transform 500 ETF ticker okay. vote as a way of trying to have more of an influence um, on large companies. What do you think of what are, are your reactions, pros and cons of doing that? Yeah. Um, so um, the so there's two questions there. Um, one, is it risky? And no, I wouldn't say it's any riskier than any other stock market investment. What the, the, the fund Bob's talking about is a fund that's trying to be an activist shareholder. They're trying to vote on company boards to sort of change, get these boards, these companies to have better behavior. Engine number one became famous by actually um, having some real success in terms of changing board members. Uh, what was it at Exxon? I can't remember. They, um, I think they put three members on the board at Exxon, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, something like that. Um, so obviously that strategy can help. Um, I am not a big believer in that strategy. I think engine number one is the exception that proves the rule that companies ignore votes of shareholders. <laughs> um, it, it, it was newsworthy. It happened once in the last 10 years that activists managed to get, um, a few board members, uh, uh, more progressive board members on the board of a fossil fuel company. I would rather not have my money supporting any fossil fuel company than a slim chance of slightly changing their board in a company that's never, that just doesn't have the skills to be anything but a fossil fuel company. The best thing a fossil fuel company can do is never invest anymore, return all their money to shareholders. I, I'm totally disagreement with Joe Biden that he's mad at fossil fuel companies for not drilling more and returning their money to shareholders. No, they should return all their money to shareholders and never drill another well. <laughs> that would be the best thing they could possibly do. Um, so um, yeah, I'm not a big believer in that. Um, I also don't know that I'm right about that. I mean, I it's just my opinion and it can definitely be argued every way. And I'm glad that there are activist shareholders out there. I think we need them. Um, I, I don't think it's the most effective use of our money, but you know, I also don't think that marching um, in a protest is a very effective use of my time, but I do think we need people marching and protesting because I think it does make an effect. Um, is it the most effective thing I can do with my time? Uh, I don't really think so. I think I can do more effect by coaching. Um, but um, I'm glad there are the people who are out there with their time doing that. I'm glad they're doing it. And I'm glad engine number one and the people who are putting their money in that fund are doing that too. It's a lot better than just buying the stock market and ignoring it. Uh, you're muted, Joe. We have another uh, question from Lawrence. Hi, Tom. I, I waited to the end because this isn't really a personal investing question, just a, a sort of market question. Can you talk a little bit about how dynamic the venture capital market is for ESG, how available funds are? are is money flowing well, or is there more needed? Not that we all could do it, but I'm just curious your state of the um, new initiatives. In it's this. getting better. Um, I think they're actually, you know, so the early stage, the the money going into early stage companies has been pretty good. Um, it's very cyclical. It was a lot better um, a year ago. There's sort of been a pullback. And actually, the collapse of Silicon Valley banks was a problem for that because Silicon Valley Bank, they were, they're not a venture investor, but they, they were really good at funding a lot of early projects for these startups. Um, so, I mean, I, it, it's been better, it's been worse, um, and uh, it could, we could always use more. I mean, basically, you ask any, anything about solving the climate problem, does it need more money? The answer is yes. <laughs> um, so, yes. But, we could, but, but are there some companies, which have venture companies, which have specialized in and are very knowledgeable about opportunities that more traditional investors might consider bad bets? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, 
there there are a lot of them out there. Um, okay. Good. Um, and I, I mean, actually, and the the style of investing I do in the stock market is sort of the antithesis antithesis of that. Um, I, I try to even stay away from early stage stock market companies that are very late, you know, very late stage for them. Um, but again, you know, just because I'm not putting my money there doesn't mean I, I don't think it's really worthwhile that some people are. I just know I don't have the skill set. Um, Good. Thanks. So, yeah. Okay. Hey, I don't see any other questions right now. Okay. Great. I, well, yeah, this was was great, Tom. And uh, you know, I I don't have a lot of money to invest, but I loved your emphasis on you know some of the basics like paying off your debt first, and then investing in you know decarbonizing. Those are great in personal investments to make. Um, and and I and I love the fact that you pr suggest prioritizing that over you know investing in the markets. So yeah. I no, I I actually see. Um, like owning fossil fuel powered equipment and a fossil fuel powered home is like the same as having a mortgage. Um, when you have a home that doesn't generate its own energy, you're paying bills for fossil fuels every month that just disappear like interest on your mortgage. Um, and you know, you can pay off that mortgage. You can pay off. If you do all those things, you're lowering, lowering the whole risk of your not just your stock portfolio but the portfolio of your total assets and it's really your total assets that is what supports you um i pay maybe a thousand dollars a year for all energy um including wow. fuel for my car electric bills well that's it that's all i have electric bills um the fuel for my car is electric bills um but <laughs> and everything else and it's maybe a thousand dollars a year actually it may have gone up to like 1200 a year with the recent rises in price i don't have quite enough solar but with that low you know most people are paying five six thousand yeah. uh, maybe more depending if they drive a lot um and that's money that is i don't i don't have to my income can be lower you know if the market goes wrong that's another four thousand dollars that I just don't have to come up with every year, um, and it's because I've invested in all these things in my home. Right. right. Um, I but if since we're if we're done with questions, less more come up. I do wanted to I wanted to let people like uh, John talk about their various Earth Day events that people uh, uh, might want to go to. Uh, I know John had one, and like raise your hand if you have others, or put them in the chat for people. Yeah, John did put his in the chat. Yeah, I put it in the chat. Um, we're going to have, uh, does anybody know Marilyn Manos Jones? She lives in the area. Yeah, she's she's great. She's a vibrant speaker. Um, and she'll come out for an hour or two to um, tell a bunch of stories because it'll all be outside. Um, so there won't be any PowerPoints or anything like that. Yeah. She'll tell her amazing stories of going to Mexico to watch the, or I think she actually, uh, took a flight with a with a monarch down to the mountains of Mexico or something or other but she's she's great and we'll be planting pollinator plants as well and there'll be catered food um so uh come on out it's uh in Samsonville what was the name of that road again um was, uh, in Samsonville oh uh sundown road in, in Samsonville but you can go on to uh um, up, up here on the Facebook page uh, for Town of Rochester ECC and get more information. Um, the time would be uh, uh, one o'clock, one to three, two hours. Yeah. So I see Sustainable putting them, put their event calendar. Joe just put his cal calendar up there. That's good. Um, yeah, we're, we're doing um, on, on Earth Day, there's two events going on in Putnam. There's, uh, I don't know if anybody <laughs> on our, our talk here is from Putnam County. But I'll mention that um, the town of Phillipstown is having an Earth Day Fair. Sustainable Putnam will be there, among others, and uh, the local Climate Smart Community Task Force. And I'm also I'm doing a talk on how to fund your home energy improvements using the Inflation Reduction Act and uh, New York State tax credits and utility rebates um, at uh, Putnam Valley Library. Uh, and I'll be doing the same talk um, on Zoom with uh, State Senator uh, Pete Harcum uh, in May. 
So yeah, if you you know, join our our email list, you'll you'll get a notification of that. I think it's May seventeenth. Um, Bob, I think he was I, waving by. I saw Bob. Oh, oh no, you. No, no. I well, I um, used to live in New York, Westchester County. And I was chair of the Conservation Advisory Commission, um, but I now live in California. So oh. I'm going to offer an idea that, uh, despite the lack of proximity, might be of interest. Um, the church that I go to now has an Earth Care Committee, and we are showing on Earth Care Sunday a film called 2040. It is a film made by um, Damon Gamow, who is Australian, and it tells the story of what the earth might be like if we were able to make the choices to adopt existing technologies. So it's a kind of um, hopeful, forward-looking uh, film, and it presents a lot of uh, potential investment opportunities, I think, um, kind of in broad concept. So are, are, are they showing that online or should we just look it up on Netflix? You can look, it's available on various streaming services, Amazon, Apple TV, and undoubtedly others, and fairly inexpensive to rent or buy. What, what is the name again, Bob? 2040. It's tw 2040, the numerals 2040. Yeah. And if you Google search it, look, uh, put in 2040 film and it'll come right up. And it's connected with a website that is looking um, for uh, kind of building a culture of regeneration. Great, thank you. So uh, thank you for allowing me all the way from California to join you. <laughs> Welcome back again. Yeah. I remember you were on one of my recent ones too, or not so recent ones. Um, yeah, I'm going to be uh, just at a uh, repair cafe here at, in uh, Marble Town. Actually, it's in Rosendale at uh, the Roundup Municipal Center, if you're in Marble Town in Rosendale, which is where, um, if you're not familiar with the repair cafe movement, they you can take in your broken stuff and people volunteer and come in and help you fix it. Um, to very more sort of uh, the opposite end of the sustainability spectrum from investing to keeping your stuff alive and not having to buy new stuff. That's great. Tom, now I have to ask, what do you fix? What do you work uh, on? I actually, I'm just helping them set up. And if someone needs coaching, I'll do that. I, I do, I do, uh, I am a woodworker and I can fix things, but I couldn't figure out how to carry my table saw um, <laughs> into that. That's great. See, you can tell I'm a woodworker, the kind, the not, the not so good kind. We have all five fingers, so. Oh, no, that's, if you look, one of them. One of them is a little short. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Gotta I'm a be better investor than I am a woodworker. Yeah, there's got to be a good story behind that one. <laughs> uh, not really. Just rushing. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again, Tom. I really appreciate your time and, you know, all the, uh, the wealth of knowledge that, uh, that you provided tonight, um, and and is there a, a way for uh, people to contact you if? Uh, um, yeah, if you... um, Marble Town ECC at Gmail works. Uh, Tom Conrad at Gmail works. I think I put it on my slide. Did I? How um, much is a coaching session? Um, it's free, but for you, I'll give you a twenty percent off discount. <laughs> thank you all um, right well i'm gonna stop recording now i think great if i can find the should be at the bottom yeah it's not thanks a lot tom uh it's up in the upper left corner